Awesome, thank you so much, Jess. So hello everyone, once again, uh, my name is Nella Sergeva and I am the Transboundary Program Coordinator at Europark Federation. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar, the topic of which is Transboundary Nature Conservation, Engaging Decision Makers, Communities and Media in a United Approach. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Jessica mecklen kolinic who is joining us from the communications department and who will ensure that we don't have any technical issues. Without any further say, let me begin the webinar. Some important information uh, before we start, please note that this webinar is recorded. The reason we are recording uh, this is to be able to present you both the recording itself and the presentations of our speakers at the end of the webinar, since we do share all the information uh, with the rest of the public and we try to um, enrich as many people as possible with the great information that um, is being presented on our webinars. Regarding the questions, please note that all of them will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. However, I highly encourage you to write them all in the chat box during the presentations processes themselves. However, please do ensure that you include the name of the speaker uh, as you're asking your questions so that at the end also the question process flows smoothly. For those of you who don't know us yet, what is the Europark Federation? It's very important to know that we are a members organization and we are driven directly by the needs of our members. Other than that, we are the largest and the oldest network of protected areas. And last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. Europark Federation consists of 400 members at the moment who come from 38 countries and we are very proud to say that only 60% of our members are protected areas. Everybody else comes from the groups of different networks, from different individuals, from different ministries and agencies, so we're always happy to include more and more people from more and more countries that are in any way related to protected areas and that would like to learn more about how to best conserve our natural heritage. Finally, we what we do at Europark is that we facilitate international, international exchange and we offer conferences, seminars, workshops, we offer the members to unite into different sections, task forces, and commissions. We also do trainings, offer case studies and different toolkits, as well as help at the policy level to connect nature protected, uh, protected area managers with the policy makers. And of course, the webinars like this is something that we do to make sure that the public has the opportunity to learn more about what exactly in this case is transboundary conservation. Europark also offers its members to join different programs. And one of these programs is exactly transboundary program. We have celebrated its 20, 20th anniversary last year. And we are very proud to say that we have collected the case studies from our amazing transboundary certified areas this year, as we are willing really to share them with the rest of the world. So do stay tuned because some amazing work that will summarize the challenges and the opportunities that the protected areas, transboundary protected areas are facing will be coming out soon by the end of this year. Another important thing about transboundary program is that we do TransparkNet meetings on a yearly basis. This year, TransparkNet happened in healthy transboundary area between Norway and Finland, and it made sure that over 50 different professionals that are related to protected area management have come together and discussed the topics that were the most important to them this year. Uh, this was also the video that was playing on the screen. And for further information regarding the TransparkNet meeting, please do scan the QR code that is available on the screen. 
because I am sure that the information we have covered and that the information we have shared with the reports, as well as on our website, which you can also see the link to uh, on the slide, is very relevant to you and the work you're doing within the protected area management sphere. Finally, this webinar itself was inspired exactly by the discussions that we have had in TransparkNet um, within the task force meeting. So this is another great proof that what we discuss with our members does come true. Without any further say, I would like to introduce you, I would like to introduce to you rather our amazing speakers that are joining us today. The first person to present will be Simona Pohlova, who's joining us today from DG Radio, a European Commission, and she will talk about the aspect of decision making and policy with respect to transboundary conservation efforts. Next on will be Anna Nikolov, who's gladly joining us from the AEBR Balkans office. And Anna will also explain the challenges and the opportunities that the Balkan countries are facing with respect to transbound with respect to transboundary conservation. And I am very sure that the ideas you will grasp from Anna's presentation today will also help you to get more curious and get more involved with the transboundary program itself that we offer. Next on, we will be joined by James Fan, who is the executive director of Earth Journalism Network. James will present the media aspect with respect to transboundary conservation, which is just amazing to be joined by him since James represents 25,000 journalists across the world that are working on this and various other matters. And finally, we will be joined and we will hear a presentation from the amazing Martin, Martin Stari, who is the head of nature conservation department in Shumova National Park. And amazingly, he is also representing one of the Europark certified transboundary areas uh, between Shumova National Park and Bavarian Forest National Park. So moving on, we would like to start with um, Simona Pahlova. Jess, would you be able to share the presentation, please? Thank you, Nela. Could you stop sharing? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. OK. Can Good afternoon. Perfect. Okay, so I see that the presentation is on. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Simona Polova. Uh, indeed, I work at the European Commission at the uh, DG um, Directorate General for Regional and Urban Policy. Um, I am uh, deputy head uh, of the unit dealing with uh, internal cross-border cooperation and interreg. And uh, indeed, it's a pleasure for me uh, today to uh, make a small presentation about what regional policy does and more particularly what we do under Interreg or European Territorial Cooperation uh, to uh, help uh, protecting the, the nature across borders. The next slide, please. Just a couple of words about a reminder what uh, EU cohesion policy or regional policy, uh, as we call it, uh, does. The main aim is um, to uh, reduce to reduce the, the regional disparities, so disparities in the development of the different regions of the EU, also of different types of regions, like mountains or islands. Uh, we are very territory-based policy, so uh, we do care uh, where the funds are coming and the, what are the types of um, of areas that we are supporting and uh, it's uh, approximately one third of the uh, European Union budget goes to cohesion policy and within that there are three percent uh, or eight billion uh, of EU funds which are dedicated to European territorial cooperation. You may say that this is not too much uh, but at the same time, it has a, a lot of impact 
and uh, and the European Union added value, because these funds uh, are invested in uh, the programs and projects which uh, go beyond national borders. They cross. There are cross-border programs, transnational and we, as we call it, and interregional programs, and all of these uh, invest in the actions which uh, which require cooperation and uh, nature protection is of course uh, a very pertinent topic as we will see later on what we also do uh, in my unit is uh, that we uh, we are making sure uh, on the long term that uh, people who are living in border areas uh, are uh, there that the obstacles to their uh, to their quality of life are being uh, removed or reduced uh, we have uh, in DG Regio what we what is called border focal point and uh, actually uh, one third of the EU population lives in border areas so this is a, an important policy which tries to remove the obstacles which are represented by by national borders and also uh, DG Regio is also coordinating and facilitating so-called macro regional strategies for example Danube strategy or Alpine space strategy let's go to the to the Next slide, please. Um, which is more uh, indeed about uh, European territorial cooperation or Interreg. Interreg is a brand which is uh, quite well known. I hope that you all know it. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is one of the two goals of the of cohesion policy. And as I said, uh, it has features which are developing the, the for example, cross-border regions, but also uh, cooperation projects are helping uh, to engage uh, regional and local authorities, but also the citizens of people living in those areas. So this, this is the, one of the main added values that it makes people work together on joint programs and projects. And like this, it is also building trust and uh, solidarity across borders. Please go to the next slide. Um, here you have the overview of uh, the types of programs that we have in Interreg. It's no surprise uh, that there is quite a high number of those, 86, because uh, we have in the in the European Union only, we have uh, 48 borders. Um, and uh, we are also covering uh, the borders on the EU external uh, side, so the EU external borders, there are also uh, cross-border cooperation programs with the neighborhood partner countries uh, and also with the with the enlargement countries, with the IPA. Uh, and we also have what we call transnational cooperation programs that are covering larger territories, such as, uh, as I said, uh, Danube or Alpine space or or a Black Sea Basin program as well. And then we have four interregional cooperation programs which are covering the whole of the European Union. And also, uh, as a last but not least, we have programs which are covering the outermost regions and their cooperation with external partners. Please, let's go to the next slide. Um, Interreg or co territorial cooperation uh, contributes to uh, the five policy objectives, which are the same for the whole of cohesion policy. Uh, you can see them on the slide. Uh, it is no surprise that greener, uh, low carbon, um, uh, transitioning toward a net zero carbon economy uh, or as we call it familiarly uh, policy objective 2 PO2 is uh, currently uh, the biggest uh, area of investment uh, notably for Interreg uh, and uh, if you move to the next slide um, 
there we can see uh, the the amount of funding that is dedicated to this policy objective of greener Europe. It's uh, 3.6 billion euros, uh, and that uh, also uh, is based on uh, on the the legal. Uh, obligation to invest at least 30% of the cohesion policy allocation on the actions related to uh, policy objective two and uh, namely the, the climate change. Uh, we, we have what we call climate tracking and biodiversity tracking. So, um, so every cohesion policy program is somehow tracked if it contributes and the way how it contributes uh, to the greener greener europe uh, objective uh, the uh, as as interreg we are uh, very strongly uh, represented and supporting uh, all the specific objectives under uh, the Greener Europe policy objective. Uh, among those, the stronger one or the, the, is the, the climate change adaptation uh, objective, but the biodiversity uh, and nature protection come as a second most um, supported objective under the Interreg programs. So indeed, uh, Interreg is very big on biodiversity and nature protection. And uh, again, uh, that should not be uh, any kind of surprise because nature come, goes across borders. Uh, we will uh, later on, we will hear about uh, the border between uh, Czech Republic and, Sh and, uh, and Bavaria, the, the Šumava and uh, and uh, Bayerische Wald is a good example of, of how the, the nature protection areas are stretching along the borders. And we do believe that Interreg is a key player to help uh, the, the, the authorities, the people who are managing these nature and green areas uh, to come together, to cooperate across borders and uh, like this uh, to um, as well um, help uh, to protect these areas uh, better. Uh, let's let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I have been speaking about the the budget and the the, the financial allocations uh, at the beginning. We have seen the the, the allocation to uh, to to interact. Uh, and just to signal that I'm speaking about uh, in, the, in the EU jargon, what we say about a programming period, meaning the, the seven year budget, uh, the European Union budget of uh, going from 2021 to 2027. So here the figures that you can see uh, are the ones from uh, the current programs, 21, 27 programs, uh, where you, as you can see uh, the um the biodiversity and nature protection uh the amount of funds that that will go uh to uh to the nature protection and biodiversity reaches uh nearly um 1 billion euros it's 951 uh and uh and in in the in in the lower part of the slide you can see all the different uh as we call them, intervention areas or actions that can be topics which can be supported under this uh, specific objective of nature protection and biodiversity. I will ask you to still move to the next slide. Um, Maybe before we, we go into, uh, uh, into the, the presentation of, of two project examples that I have here, uh, it would be relevant to mention that uh, we, um, as I said, we do not only uh, invest the funds uh, into, into the nature protection projects, uh, but there are also very important uh, principles and environmental legislation that has to be respected when uh, there are any kind of, uh, of heavy infrastructure investments under, under cohesion policy overall and Interreg included. So meaning that uh, we have the strategic environmental assessment, which is an obligation uh, 
before any kind of program uh, is put in place. Uh, so already at the times of the preparation of, of programs, uh, the, 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 the program authorities have to undertake a strategic environmental assessment. So examine how the uh, activities foreseen under the program will impact uh, will impact nature uh, and environment. Uh, and then later on, this obligation is also put on the level of, um, of projects. So wherever there is an infrastructure project, uh, there is an obligation to undergo the uh, environmental impact assessment. And also, uh, as a newly introduced, we have uh, what we call a do no harm principle, which is also a kind of a proofing uh, before a program is adopted, whether or not uh, it will uh, have uh, an impact on the territory where where it is uh, where, where it will be active, where it will support support projects. So this uh, do no harm, do no significant harm principle is in, also enshrined in in the in our legislation. At the end, before uh, before I finish my presentation. Uh, I have uh, chosen two examples of two Interreg uh, projects, uh, which are supporting uh, the, the specific objective of nature protection. Uh, first of them, first of uh, the, the first one is the on the waste reduction strategies. It is on the border between Italy and uh, Croatia, and it will invest in uh, uh, in in. Uh, well, as it says, waste reduction strategies and uh, in the in the nat nature uh, Natura 2000 uh, areas and uh, also other uh, important uh, nature protection areas. Uh, and the second example, which is on the on the next slide, uh, is uh, the one which is supported by a, tr a transnational cooperation program, Central Europe, uh, which is active. Well, in Central Europe, so in the in the in the countries uh, around uh, stretching from from Germany, Austria, uh, Czech Republic, and Italy, and uh, there again, it will uh, support uh, some pilot actions, uh, which uh, which are there to uh, to to um, to test pilot solutions for the restoration of uh, degraded forests. So here again, you can see that these programs are aimed to, uh, on one hand, uh, exchange of, ex of good practices and experience uh, financing pilot actions, but also uh, our programs can also invest uh, in, some, uh, in some infrastructure or, or um, nature protection uh, measures which require some investments. I will end uh, my presentation at this point, and uh, of course, I'm ready to reply to questions. Uh, I understand that those will come at the end of the of the webinar. Right? Thank you very much for your attention. Exactly. Thank you so very much, uh, Simona, for your amazing presentation. Um, we were gladly, we were very glad to hear on the opportunities that the European Commission offers. And personally, um, I was not aware of the exact budget that is currently dedicated to all the areas you've mentioned. This is amazing to know that we can use this budget for the con transboundary conservation efforts as well. So thank you very much for providing the insightful presentation. Uh, all the questions that the audience has for Simona, uh, please do uh, write them down um, and we will definitely go through them at the very end of this webinar. In the meantime, I would like to uh, give the floor to our next uh, presenter, Anna Nikolov, who will dive into the transboundary conservation that concerns the Balkans area specifically. Anna? Uh, thank you, Nella. You. I will start to share my screen. Okay. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. 
Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, it's about transboundary cooperation in the Balkan, uh, like overcoming the challenges and building the success. Uh, my name is Anna Nikolova, I'm from the Association of European Border Regions, which is celebrated like three years ago, uh, 50 anniversaries. So we are also quite old as Europark, so it's really a pleasure to, to cooperate on the, the cross-border transboundary uh, protection. Um, we have uh, around 100 members, but uh, there is like much more cross-border structure in the whole Europe, including uh, not EU countries just. And our mission is actually to find the, what is the main cross-border obstacles in all these cross-border uh, regions and uh, provide the possible solutions, exchange between the stakeholders, share the experience and try to actually uh, improve the cross-border cooperation and uh, by that uh, European integration but itself and the European cohesion. Uh, we have the Balkan office like uh, more than 10 years now and uh, I will present you some of the research that we have done in the last uh, 10 years so that can be useful actually for the natural preservation. Uh, the, the frameworks that the, we start to talk about uh, in the Balkans that are existing and that can be used actually in boosting this is uh, territorial strategic framework, which is cohesion policy, territorial agenda, macro regional strategies. Also, there is the ABR charter, which is all this is much the Madrid Island Convention with uh, uh, the additional protocols, which comes to the legal frameworks. When we have also the GTC regulation. In the Balkans, unfortunately, we don't have um, uh, the EGTCs established at the external border so far because um, there is the process to adopting the law uh, in the non-EU countries, but it's possible between the EU countries, of course. The most um, available actually for the natural preservation are bilateral and multilateral agreements that were signed in the past years, and uh, I will demonstrate that later. Funding frameworks that we had the opportunity to hear before, we have Interreg, but in the Balkans also we have the Interreg IPA for the external borders, and we have IPA CBC programs, which are between the uh, neighboring country, uh, which are uh, not the, the uh, EU member state. And there is additional things that can be used uh, for boosting the uh, natural preservation is the frameworks or transnational initiatives. In the Balkans, of course, we have the, the initiatives related to the peace and security, but what is more important uh, is that we have also the, uh, the initiatives that are related to the environmental protection. Uh, and the tools uh, here, it's just the, the brief that the tools, it's like cross-border structure, the territory integrated tools, uh, like strategies, the um, action plans, the um, uh, investment, the territory integrated investment that can be used, uh, but also you have the project and you have the, the cross-border public services. Well, the main challenges here, basically I put five, but as you probably know, there is much more, but this is the one that I will address. Uh, still in the Balkans, we do need the trust building. This is this is the, the process that needs to last for like many years and it's going slowly, but there is really a lot improvement comparing to 20 years ago. And I have to say when I did my research for my master thesis, um, like it was some 15 years ago, the, the uh, cooperating in the border areas of the Balkans, it was like in the really low level. But nowadays you have uh, so many applications that not all of them can be financed. So there is like really switch on that. And you you need, you know, even the, the uh, to build the, the, the cooperation tradition. So when it stopped, you know, during the, the conflict in the Balkan, it needs a lot of time actually to, to build on, on this uh, and have firstly the uh, non-formal uh, cooperation to, to be, actually formalized what is then the challenge is actually the this is the challenge i think in in the whole europe to have the comparable data related to the indicators that we can both use to tackle the issues and uh, the main one is actually to establish the institutional framework and management to establish the 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 
uh, cross border public service that can actually manage the the, the preservation. Uh, knowledge about the tools in the Balkans show up that is uh, really something that needs to be uh, worked on because um, there is still, there is a knowledge, it's the uh, build, but still there is a lack of knowledge of these uh, fine tuning tools that are used now in the EU that really needs to be um, uh, promoted more in the Balkans. And inclusion of the population, well, you know, this is, this is always the thing that is kind of difficult, but uh, working on this, it's uh, the continuous process which is done through the, the old cross-border program. Well, to address legislative like, framework, that the two of one that I mentioned, it's like bilateral and multilateral agreements. And the, some of the, the good examples, it's uh, that are supporting the natural conversation, it's uh, with the bilateral agreements, Star River Commission. And you, you probably know the Transboundary Biosphere uh, Reserve in the Ocrid, uh, including the, the Prespa Lake, which is also done by bilateral agreement, like projecting this area. And which is the emergency situation, I have to say, this is the main thing in the Balkan area, including the Ipa border, that is the most regulated one, which enables actually protection, not just the people and asset and, you know, uh, um, the properties, but also the nature when it comes to the landslide, when it comes to the, the forest fires, when it comes to the, the accidents that they can pollute the rivers and old areas. This is the, 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 uh, the cross-border public services that are established for many years that are really operating really well. So this is something that we can build on and actually support. Uh, by the multilateral agreements uh, here, um, well, for sure, the Sava River Commission, Danube River Commission, and you have this uh, beautiful press of work also uh, with the four countries agreement. And what I put here, it's also regional youth cooperation offices because they have one line which is dedicated to exchange of young people in the, the Western Balkans uh, on the topic of environmental protection. So when it comes to including people, you need to start with the young people that you include them through the workshop exchange. You build their mental mapping actually to have the, the vision to protect the nature in their area. So when it comes that it can be like sometimes 10 years or more to actually have the, the bilateral agreements to, to, to uh, natural protected part. So there will be the one actually that will follow that through and they will support it in the future. So the following uh, um, the youth and supporting them to, to, to actually understand why it's this important, it, it's really asset. And this is something that I really like when we also did the research about the transnational in initiative that can actually support the cross-border cooperation. Its essence is actually also not just transnational cooperation, but it's actually mostly visible in the cross-border areas. As you can see, the, the green um, uh, part is the is the environmental and cultural protection oriented. We put it together because most of them overlap. Uh, but if you separate it, it will be more than half for environment, but also more than half for a cultural protection. So as you can see here, we have also uh, in the red, the economic development, and we also have the stability piece, the environment since ever was the first contact point to boost the cross-border cooperation in the area. Uh, and it's something that all the, the stakeholders can find the joint interest because the nature is really important to all of us and we do need to protect it and we do need to uh, work on this. It doesn't matter if it's the international on cross-border level. And here is some of the, the really good examples uh, of the, the uh, uh, initiatives that are supporting this. And you can see the Green Belt initiatives uh, here as well, uh, which is really did the, a lot of impact in the, in the Balkans to, to initiate so, so people actually can connect and uh, support on, in the cross-border areas to, to complement this initiative. Uh, well, I can talk about this for, for a long time, so I will just skip to the, the next one because we also have the cross-border structures. 
Over the time in the Balkans, the, there were like uh, 43 cross-border uh, structures that, that we managed to map. So maybe there were some that uh, existed before, but we didn't manage to map them because we usually search for the data in ABR database or online what is available, but some things are not available anymore. Right now, there is 18 active of them. So, but what is very interesting in that most of them are, uh, even those that are not existing are usually are merging on the same hotspot, which are usually the environment that they want to protect. Or uh, is it the river? Is it the, the, the mountain? Or is it any natural element that they actually bring the stakeholders across the border? Firstly, to protect and improve the environment in the area. So well, this is just some of the, the examples like the KMT, which is like really, really old, uh, more than 30 years old, the uh, Ibra regions that are a member. You also have Adriatic Anion, which is related to the, the basin. And for example, Driva, uh, Drina Sava Maevica, Ibra region. So, so this is just three of them for, for a quick examples, but there is a many of them and most of them are actually addressing the environmental issues. This is something that can be capitalized on actually for the natural conservation as well. And when you look in the KIP database, I do the search with the keyword natural conversation and uh, conservation. So this is what pops up from the KIP database, like uh, 300 projects. And this is not all the projects because the, they're still uh, putting uh, uh, more and more uh, projects that are supported by the Interreg, it's transnational or the cross-border. This is for the, the, the whole European territory. But what I would like to stress here is that you have almost 2,000 partners in Europe that are willing and they found very important uh, the topic of natural conversation, uh, cons conservation, sorry. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, if you, I didn't add here environmental protection and other things that are complementing the conver co conservation actually, but I guess you can find even more partners that are working on this. And this is very the asset because there is really a lot institutions. This is like NGOs, universities, uh, public institutions, public bodies, the local authorities. So, so all of them are actually committed to this. So this is something uh, I really address you to, to, to use the KIP database because there you can find many partners to connect with the, the same topic. Actually, you can actually support all of your initiatives and learn from all of these projects because you can also find other documents and research that they've done and the obstacles that they face. And there is also something, well, uh, it, it becomes very very well known in the, the EU, but for the Balkan countries, it's still there is the uh, understanding what the cross-border public services is uh, a, a bit uh, difficult because the uh, two, three years ago, when we did together with the special foresight, the, the research about the cross-border public services at the external borders of the EU, we are collecting data. We couldn't actually um, officially confirm any because the public authorities don't understand that they think they don't do it. But the thing is, they do a lot of cross border services. What I want, want to like to stress here that the good example is the, the really nice trans border next biosphere reserve, Mura Drava Danube, which have the, the joint managing body and providing the cross border public services. And it's partly uh, in the Balkans area. And this is one good example that can serve actually to teach the, the, the national and local government and regional governments and cross-border structures what the cross-border public services mean. And this is actually management of the trans-border protected area. This is something that we can learn from each other. And this is the tool actually to use to boost. So the opportunities actually are just like, there is so many things that, that can be used. But unfortunately, you know, you, you need to build the capacities of the, 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 the border areas and the national authorities to actually use it. And uh, well, for, for the end, uh, I would really like to stress that uh, uh, DG Radio initiated and the um, um, ABR is managing on behalf of the, the DG Radio, the B Solution project, 
which is actually support to solve the, the uh, cross-border obstacles, which are administrative of the uh, uh, legal one. And it's open also for the external borders, which is mean that it's now it's open for the, the um, Balkans countries as well, those that are bordering the EU countries. And it, uh, on the, the B-Solutions um, uh, web, web page, you can find this is just one of the publications that are issued about the border regions for the European Green Deal. So, so you can find a lot of data. There are three uh, compendiums with the cases, some of them addressing actually the legal administrative uh, obstacles for the environmental protection. You can find the inspiration, but also I really encourage you to actually apply because it's really easy and it's totally different approach. You provide the problem on one page with uh, uh, what could be the effects if the problem is solved, and we will connect you with the experts that will uh, write the roadmap how to actually overcome the obstacles. So this is actually really simple tool to use and it's quick to, to get the answer and you can even get the support um, from uh, uh, from the, the the team that is managing the the uh, the B solutions project actually if you are writing so so to to actually how to write it is it is it the the legal administrative obstacle and even you can write it on your own language so all the languages are accepted so this is really opportunity that that you should use and for the end on this map you can see that uh, or the, the areas that are uh, eligible actually to apply. Uh, so you can see in the Balkans or it's overlap actually with the, the cross-border programs, inter gimpa programs. For any questions, I'm here, I will be at the end. So for you to ask, and, but if you have any additional questions, you can address me via email. And uh, well, thank you for listening and thank you for this opportunity sharing, like really briefly and really quick. I can talk about this hour, for hours, but yeah, I, I hope I, I get you interested in the, in the tools and the framework that you can actually use. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Anna Nikolov, the head of the ABR Balkan office. Anna, thank you once again for the outstanding presentation on the tools, on the commitment and on the different initiatives that are offered for the whole, you know, for the whole Europe that is in any way for all the countries within Europe that are in any way interested to cooperate on the nature conservation efforts. Um, truly outstanding presentation and really amazing tools that I'm sure our audience did not hear of, uh, you know, to the extent that you have really provided. Um, well, thank you. This is this is just related to the Balkans, but when it comes to the EU, there is even much more that you can use. So this is this is the thing. There is the tools there, but they are all over the places. So it's really difficult, you know, to to use them all because you, you don't have them on the one place that you can actually, you know, <laughs> pick them up. Okay, I need this, this, and that. This is maybe something to think about in the future to to target the the natural conservation specifically. Yes, so true. And speaking of the B solutions that you have also mentioned, this is something that we already did as well, the webinar on. So if uh, any of you from this audience is interested, please do visit our Europarks YouTube channel and just look for B solutions webinar. It should be available right there at your disposal at any time. Next on, we are joined by James Fan. Um, James, can you hear us? Uh, can you connect your presentation yes yes hello hey there Amazing. yes um, we can hear you well thank you so much for joining us today james james will present uh the aspects of the media with respect to nature conservation efforts. He comes uh, with an amazing background in this area, and I'm very sure that you can all grasp some very valuable insights that can benefit your work. James, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I am sharing my screen. Can you all see this? Yes, we can. Okay. Hold on just a second. So hi, everyone. My name is James Vaughn. I'm the director of Internews' Earth Journalism Network. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Um, 
We support environmental journalism around the world. We are a global community of over 25,000 journalists dedicated to improving coverage of climate and environmental issues. And as you can imagine, a lot of our work is focused on supporting transboundary transboundary conservation. And we have a lot of ways that we do that. Um, I just want to first stress how important it is the meet, to have the media promoting the, uh, these activities um, because we can help establish, because uh, we can enable support uh, better policies that, that improve cross-border uh, conservation cooperation. Um, we bring attention to the challenges and also the successes that transboundary projects have. Um, one of the ways we do this, I'm going to dive right in because I have a hard stop at 6 p.m., but um, uh, we help establish and strengthen networks of environmental journalists around the world. We have partner networks in places like the Mekong region, Southeast Asia, in Nepal, in East Africa, there's Water Journalists for Africa, in the Pacific Islands News Association, in Latin America, there's a group called Latin Clima, in Southern Africa, there's Oxpeckers. So these are just examples. There are many other such networks, and there's uh, every reason to think we could have a similar network in the Balkans. Um, we also support the creation of regional environmental news platforms. So a lot of these uh, groups I mentioned, they have online websites, uh, Info Nile in East Africa, Equatorial in Indonesia, Pacifica in, uh, in the Pacific region, Mekong Eye, Info Amazonia is an important one in the Amazon region. Um, so uh, again, perhaps something similar can happen uh, in the Balkans. Thank you. Um, and we invest in investigative reporting projects to improve collaboration. So some examples in Latin America, we showed how uh, pollution from the Amazon flowing out through the Amazon basin is causing the largest algae bloom in the world to uh, to hit the Caribbean and uh, spoil beaches there and ecosystems. In Asia, we have several collaborative journalism projects. One that's one right now, actually, uh, if you look at our website, earthjournalism.net, we have one where we brought together various media outlets from around Asia to focus on soil degradation issues and the impacts that has on biodiversity and health. Uh, we previously had um, uh, collaborative reports on who's fo who is financing fossil fuel powered power plants in, um, in Southeast Asia. In so these are the examples of the kinds of transboundary collaborations you can have to support environmental journalism. We've had, here are some more examples. We've done a lot of investigative reports on the wildlife trade uh, be between countries and between regions, between Africa and Asia, for instance. We've looked at the sand mining operations, which is often run by, uh, through illegal means in uh, many countries. Um, so a lot, there's so much cross-border trade in illegal products. It's, you know, whether it's uh, illegal timber or illegal, illegal um, wildlife, uh, illegal fishing, um, you know, all these things, you need transboundary cooperation to uncover them. Um, we are, you know, leveraging media, and I, I, this is an important point. We're not just supporting media for its own sake, but the um, these, uh, this media work has real impacts. It changes public policies. It changes public reg uh, regulations, behavior, debate. Um, we engage often directly with communities. Um, so to make sure that they understand, not just that we're 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 hearing their voice for the for the for public audiences, but also that the news is getting back to them. We carry out information ecosystem assessments to see where people are getting their information from. Are they getting rumors, uh, misinformation, disinformation? As you all know, it's a big, big problem now. Uh, where are those rumors coming from? And then how can we provide them with good, accurate, compelling information so that they can you know, uh, come up with good solutions that work for them locally? 
Um, we're, uh, we, we do a lot of research uh, on how environmental coverage leads to uh, these changes. And if you go again to our website, earthjournalism.net, you can see a lot of research reports, uh, examples of impacts we've had. Um, uh, 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 we reported on a road project in the Colombian Amazon that would have destroyed a lot of the rainforest there. And as a result of that story, the president stepped in and actually scrapped this road project, which, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, an amazing impact. We've supported, uh, in, in the EU, we supported an inf investigation into illegal aquarium fish trade that resulted in the, in the parliament in the Netherlands, uh, investigating and, and, and looking into new regulations. And in Italy, we, we uncovered a wildlife smuggling ring that was illegally capturing songbirds. And as a result of that investigation, uh, the Italian police stepped in and apprehended uh, a smuggler. So these are the kinds of impacts you can get with good local media coverage. And that is really our goal is to get these stories into the local media. Um, many more impacts. I won't go into them all. I think you get the point that in countries around the world, uh, you, we can work with the local media to um, uncover these issues and and help uh, make sure solutions are reached. Um, we also support community-based media, um, <clears throat> so not just national uh, outlets, but also um, local radio and giving seed grants to community media outlets that really get on the ground and can fill in, you know, the decline of the traditional news media, you have lots of what they call news deserts, places that they just don't cover the local news as well as they used to. And these community-based media outlets can step in and provide that, that those news sources that otherwise would go missing. We do, we do face many challenges um, and opportunities in reporting on cross-border environmental issues. Uh, it's expensive, as you can imagine, it's expensive to get out there and to get into, um, especially, you know, conservation areas or natural areas where, which can be right might quite remote from where journalists are based. Um, it, they often, journalists often lack access to data and information. I'm sure many of you can help with that. Um, but we often have to do Freedom of Information Act requests or, um, you know, requests for transparency um and and you know frankly the rule of law and press freedom it's it's it varies quite a lot across regions and there are closing spaces in many countries so those are all things we have to uh deal with there's also big linguistic language barriers political barriers cultural barriers that make trans boundary reporting difficult um and then you got to find the stories that really interest not just journalists, but their editors, their supervisors, and then of course your your um your, their audiences. So that is really that is really the role of the journalist is to take all this information that's out there and turn it into stories. Stories is what drives conversations, what drives everything, drives policy, drives drives uh legislation. So uh that's where journalists play such a crucial role. Um so with safety can also be an issue in many regions, especially if you're uh, in doing investigative reporting. Uh, we work a lot with uh, NGO sources. Obviously, the NGOs are a really important source for journalists, but but we do have to verify and check that information. Um, we can't just use one source for our stories. We have to make sure it's all accurate. Um, we, you know, and we approach cross-border reporting from different angles. We look at supply chains. Uh, we look at solution stories as well as conservation initiatives. And, and you know, we, we leverage these stories then not just uh, maybe publishing or producing them on one media outlet, but then spreading them through social media across many different, uh, to, across many different channels. Uh, so I know one of the things uh, I was asked to talk about was how should conservation organizations effectively collaborate with journalists and media outlets so you can amplify your messages. So um, just a few tips maybe to think about. 
don't just share press releases. Uh, press releases are fine, but um, you know, journalists are taught not just to publish press releases. There would be if you can share stories or even better scoops. That is news news stories that haven't been told before. If you can prepare your information into stories, that is so appealing to journalists. They will really, um, I think, appreciate uh, if you go to them, not just with, uh, you know, a press release, but with actual stories that they can dig into and report on. Um, and don't just look for publicity for your organization. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of NGOs want that, but, um, you know, seek out news, actual, you know, news that would be of interest to the public. And then you can, you know, of course, get your get get your name in uh in the news as well. But if you make the news come first and not publicity, that is a good strategy. Uh, give journalists uh access to sources of information. A lot of times, we're investigating stories we don't know, especially if we're going to or traveling to a different region. We may not have sources in those regions. Um, we may not have access to data there. That's where um conservation organizations and NGOs can can really help uh, journalists to to get the data they need to get the sources connect uh, connect journalists with your experts uh, we often look for good experts who can provide good quotes good sources good information so if you have experts let the journalists know about them and you know, if you can organize field trips, get the journalists out of the newsrooms, offer them a trip. I know it takes money. Uh, a lot of this takes money and time, but um, organize these field trips to um, to help journalists reach these transboundary areas where they may not have been before or may not have easy access to. So all these things can be helpful in engaging the media to cover transboundary issues. Um, another, uh, also, and finally, this is something we do a lot is, is facilitate opportunities for learning and exchanging, uh, information with peers in the media and experts in the field. So, uh, you can offer one of the, one of the things we do is we offer a lot of fellowships. We bring journalists to major conferences. These are wonderful opportunities. If you bring a journalist to a conference, um, they not only get good stories that they send back home to their media outlets, but they also learn so much about the issue you care about. Um, so that is a great way we provide these fellowships to conferences, um, for instance, to uh, major climate summits, biodiversity summits, ocean summits, things like that. If you have a conference uh, you're organizing, you know, uh, consider, don't, don't just invite journalists to attend, but help them to attend, maybe provide some financial support to help them attend. And um, I think that will pay off with good coverage. Uh, training workshops are also a great way to engage with journalists. Journalists are always looking for training. We, we have broad-based general expertise in the field, but a lot of these topics are really specific and require a lot of you know, technical expertise that a journalist may not have, but if you can provide them with training, capacity building opportunities, they will really appreciate that. And they're off, often become much more engaged in the topics that you care about. You can create online groups, uh, forums. We have a lot of these online groups, whether it's through email groups or social media groups, all kinds of uh, groups you can set up, whether on, on some of the social media platforms. And that's changing all the time, of course, but those are a great way to foster discussion, engagement, and get news and information out about the issues you care about. And then, you know, like this webinar, okay, this is a great example. Um, I, I don't know how many journalists are here, but you can create webinars that attract journalists uh, or do uh, ask me anything, you know, uh, sessions where you invite journalists to send in their questions and then, you know, you all, give them free range to ask whatever they want, and then you you respond to their questions as best you can. All these are good uh, strategies to engage with the media about conservation efforts. Uh, I thought I'd spend a few minutes just telling you about our, our work at the Earth Journalism Network. We are a project of internews, and our mission is to strengthen local journalism 
that serve communities and policymakers on the front lines of the climate and environmental crises. And we really want to help shape solutions, hold power to account, and you know, spur action. Uh, here are some numbers about our operations. We, as I mentioned, we have over 25,000 journalist members around the world, including many in the Balkans. We have trained over 16,000 journalists in uh, environment and climate issues over the last 20 years. And we've directly supported production of over 15,000 stories um, on these topics. Uh, that is another strategy we do is we actually give out small grants, sometimes larger grants to journalists and media outlets to actually produce stories on the topics that uh, we care about and that we're funded to give. Uh, we've given over $3 million in grants over the last seven years uh, through, uh, uh, through over 770 grants awarded, and we get tens of thousands of applications for our work. So, um, it's it's a really challenging mission, but we're we believe this is here's our theory of change that if we can get journalists around the world to report more effectively on the environment through training and financial support and other types of technical support, and if these networks of journalists are strengthened to uh, facilitate exchange of information, especially with local communities, researchers, and policymakers, then the quality and quantity of environmental reporting will be increased and improve trust in in the media and encounter the spread of mis and disinformation. And that will lead to the public being better informed about climate and environmental threats, as well as solutions that help mitigate those threats so that everyone will be better equipped to demand action and positive change from policymakers and other decision makers and hold them to account. So that is a very quick, uh, quick. Um, oh, I wanted to mention also, we had, um, we recently came out with a research project called Covering the Planet, it included the largest ever survey of climate and environmental journalists around the world. We had over 818 journalists uh, and editors um, en engaged. We had survey responses from 744 journalists in, uh, from 102 countries. And I would encourage you to go to our website to check out the results. I mean, there's some really surprising things. Most journalists, about three quarters of all journalists said that a lack of resource really limits their coverage of these issues. So we need to get more resources out to the media. You can't just rely on them to, to show up at your events. You've got to help them get there, frankly. And so, you know, and, and based on the findings of this report, you know, researchers recommended better collaboration among newsrooms, which will be, will, which would support better coverage of transboundary cooperation and knowledge sharing between journalists. So I think that's it for me. Uh, I hope that was informative. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I do have to uh, step out soon, but it's really been a pleasure talking to you. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so very much, James, for joining us today. Um, just for you who didn't catch it uh, again, James is coming from the um, Earth uh, Journalism Network. And I am sure that you have managed to see the numbers very clearly and the audience that really James will work with and that James is directing. Um, I, I think it's always amazing and very inspiring to see that uh, so many people are interested in resolving environmental issues and uh, working on the environmental matters. And this is definitely what uh, today's world needs. Thank you so much once, once again, James. Uh, for those of you who have questions uh, to James, please make sure to write them down in the chat. We will read them out or you will have the opportunity to open the microphone and present them yourself um, later on. Um, we are now moving on to Martin Stari from Shumova National Park, uh, who is also coming from the certified transboundary area between um, Shumova and uh, Bavarian National Forest Park. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, 
Thank you, uh, Nella and uh, the Europark Federation to give me the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you and to share my thoughts. <clears throat> Okay, so I come from uh, one of the Banda region, uh, from uh, the Schumacher National Park on the Czech uh, German Bond, the Czech German Austrian Bonders, and uh, I would like to share my experience from the cross border uh, cooperation uh, from this area. So uh, again, it is on the Czech German boundaries. Uh, on the Czech side, there is a national park. Uh, on the Bavarian side, there is a national park as well. On the Austrian side, there is unfortunately no large scale protected area. But uh, anyway, we are collaborating with our um, Austrian um, uh, neighbors as well. Um, so what are the, uh, the barriers we are facing in our region? Um, the biggest uh, barrier uh, is, of course, the language, in my opinion. Uh, we are at the area of the former Iron Curtain. The Czech Republic, or at that time Czechoslovakia, uh, was a part of the Soviet Union um, uh, influence. And the Germany, or Bavaria, was the Western part. Um, and after the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, <coughs> Uh, the Shumova National Park was uh, was founded. Um, so it's a mountain. Uh, it is a mountain um, ridge, uh, and it's also a division between Czechs and uh, Germans. So, it, but if we speak about the uh, about the community involvement, of course. Um, uh, this is what we don't would like to this uh, this is not our uh, target um, we want to include the locals we want to include uh, the local this decision makers uh, and include them into the measures connected with the nature protection Shumova National Park is a unique uh, late landscape uh, with a uh, unique, uh, a big area where uh, natural processes uh, are uh, allowed. Um, it is a mountain ridge, and as I said, it's an uh, uh, it's, uh, area of a former Iron Curtain on this page, uh, or on this photo you can still see uh, the line of the former Iron Curtain. Um, and um, and you can see also uh, the uh, the landscape. So as I said, the cross border cooperation started right after uh, the 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 boundaries or the state border was opened after the Velvet uh, Revolution. This is one of the first uh, common um, uh, common uh, events, uh, uh, first information points. And um, I have to say um, uh, that the language barrier is uh, one of the crucial uh, challenges or or or, bond, uh, or boundaries we are uh, uh, we are facing, and that's why it is important to mention uh, on this photo this this tall uh, tall guy in red uh, shirt. Um, uh, it, this is a uh, our common employee, uh, uh, so his half position on the Czech side and half position on the Bavarian side, and he is uh, able uh, to overcome this language barrier uh, because he spent uh, um, a lot of his, his professional time in Germany and uh and he is czech so that's why uh he can solve this language barrier but um just the fact that he is half time employed on one side and half time employed also on the other side he can also so uh, solve 
uh, the operational problems we are facing between our two national parks and use the personal relations. So this is also important. But if we uh, get back to the uh, to the locals and to the uh, to the uh, cross border uh, cooperation, of course, uh, the physical movement is a crucial for a good uh, cross-border cooperation. So that is why we uh, also started um, on both sides of the of the mountain range uh, uh, a, pub, a system of public transport uh, which goes into the national park in, in the environmentally friendly way. Uh, so use the public uh, transportation system, which is also connected. Uh, it's uh, it's not easy. You have to imagine that uh, uh, that it's a mountain ridge, but uh, also during these forty years of uh, uh, of communist area, uh, this was the end of the world from for for both sides. So many of the connections, many of the roads has been blocked uh, and destroyed. And uh, that is why the physical uh, connection between between two uh, sides is not uh, is not easy. So it's uh, it's important to maintain the physical possibilities to cross the border, and um, uh, and it's also important that uh, that both systems are functioning. Uh, so on both sides. Uh, this uh, uh, this system is financed by a local authorities by a local local governments. Uh, it was started by uh, by both national parks, and but the financing is uh, is supporting uh, from from the locals. So what are uh, the other uh, activities we are doing? Of course, we are doing um, uh, environmental education. So we are trying to do it bilingually and provide uh, the um, lectures and uh, environmental education activities uh, for uh, both languages. We are organizing a field guides, uh, preparing a lot of information materials and brochures in uh, both languages. Uh, since 2015, um, we are preparing each year a common uh, calendar uh, for, for both sides. We have uh, a lot of information um, brochures. But we also wanted to point out that we are one region and we have one goal. That is why we also invented a common logo, which we use uh, for this uh, cross-border information um, uh, materials. And in the center of this logo is the word park uh, as a national park, as, as, as the as the target of our, all of our, our in, um, activities. It has been also here mentioned that uh, that the Interreg fund uh, from the European Union uh, is a crucial and very uh, very important um, uh, source of fundings uh, for our cross border activities. This is just a, a, a short list of some of uh, our uh, common uh, projects. From this list, I would may, maybe point out uh, the first one, the establishment of cross-border social economic uh, monitoring. This is uh, this was a project uh, which used uh, the same methodology on both sides of the national park uh, to questionnaire uh, the visitors of both national park to have a relevant data about uh, the vis visitor management and uh, and the feedback from uh, for our activities um but if we want to focus a little bit more uh, on the local uh, economy and local interests of the local um uh, of the local um inhabitants of both both areas we want to promote the connection with the national parks. Uh, so we invented on both sides uh, 
so-called National Park Partner Program. Uh, this is a, uh, um, a, a way uh, of promoting um, uh, agencies for events, uh, but, uh, but also uh, accommodation, uh, local accommodation, which fulfilled our um, quality um, requirements. Uh, and are of course local and are promoting the ideas of uh, the national park. So it is running on the both sides of uh, of the national parks, and there are a certain cr criteria of uh, of the quality, as I said, and we are uh, evaluating uh, them uh, annually, and we are meeting uh, the the people annually and giving give give uh, are trying to give them. The information from from the area in my opinion uh, one of very important activities we are doing which at the first glance doesn't look like the activities working with the local are our wilderness guides uh, on both sides of the boundary we have a system of um, uh, of uh, educated guides uh, um, who, who are guiding uh, the visitors into the area. Um, and they are uh, guiding them uh, in, in the normal uh, uh, areas, but they are also, uh, or we are also giving uh, the visitors the possibilities to, uh, to guide them somewhere where is normally not allowed to go, but in this controlled manner, it is possible. And um, the way why I'm, it is of course very popular uh, for for the visitors to use this kind of service. Um, but um, I wanted to mention that we are um, educating uh, more and more uh, guides than we need it. And um, the the reason why we uh, educate more and more guides is of course that. We want to have enough uh, guides, but we also are trying to communicate internally as an organization with the locals and uh, with the local community. So the most of the or uh, all of the uh, guides are not employees of the national park, but they are uh, locals. And we are uh, in that way trying to communicate with the local communities and uh, pick up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, those ones who are motivating to spread and multiply, to apply the idea of nat nature protection. And that is why, uh, we are doing this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, activities. And I'm really proud that we have a first, uh, really good results, practical results from our re region. On both sides, currently we have two mayors of the uh, of the uh, of the local municipalities who used to be in the past the guides, these wilderness uh, guides. Uh, so they are helping us uh, also with within the co co communication with with the locals. And as a last, I would like to mention that um, we you have seen we are a, a flat mountain area. So uh, we are important wetland area with a lot of um, mires, uh, rivers, uh, and uh, water bodies. And that is why we are also focusing on restoration of the water regime, which has been uh, in the past quite heavily uh, influenced by drainages. Um, and uh, this is an example of, of one of the project, which is running to the end this year, uh, where we uh, uh, are restoring almost 50 localities and restoring uh, uh, about more than 2000 hectares of mires and wetlands. Um, but uh, it is of course an, a very important um, tool how to communicate with the, with the public because the water is uh, an, um, uh, uh, a public uh, issue and of course during the last months we were facing a big floodings and uh, if you restore a natural water regime 
uh, you can also um, uh, give the opportunity uh, to mitigate uh, the floods uh, on the natural uh, basis. But of course, it's a it's a good uh, adaptation measures against the droughts. But within the project, we are also trying to involve as much public as we can. Uh, so we are organizing so-called days for Myers, where where the volunteers um, comes uh, to the national parks and are helping manually uh, to restore uh, to restore the drainage ditches or the, uh, restore the no, not the drainage but restore the uh, the natural water regimes by blocking during the uh, through blocking the drainage ditches and here is a nice example nice nice photo that's also more generation can participate it we are also organizing it since uh, 2019 uh it cross border and we have uh had more than uh hundreds of uh of uh, of uh, partic participants from bavaria all together is almost uh, 1000 people taking part on uh, on that so thank you for your attention in my uh, uh for me uh, the way how we work with everyone, but uh, with the local is a personal experience. This is not only uh, uh, relevant if we speak about the restoration of the water uh, regime or uh, or working in the uh, manually in the field. But in my uh, experience, it is also uh, the case of uh, of working with the locals. If we speak uh, about the guides and uh, their invo involvement in our activities, so thank you for your attention. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Martin, for this amazing presentation with respect to the community involvement in the transboundary conservation efforts. I'm sure that our members have grasped essential ideas on how to better engage um, local parties in the projects they are doing, and they will be able to obviously use the ideas that you have provided further on in their um, conservation efforts. I have also noted that there is a comment on your um, presentation which says, uh, thank you for mentioning the mobility issue. Another problem is local healthcare in these areas that are often isolated from the world. Young people are moving away from these areas and older people are not supported. So protected areas must be repopulated with young people and sustainable ideas financed by Europe. Where there is no work, there is no culture and seasonal tourism, in my opinion, is not the solution. If there are no services, people run away. This was the comment from Nicola Labanca. I just wanted to make sure that we note in this comment um, at the end of the presentation as well. So once again, thank you everyone to all of the amazing speakers. Um, if it's possible uh, to ask the members of the audience to switch on their cameras now as we will quickly move on to the Q&A session. Uh, that would be amazing. It's always nice to see uh, people uh engaged uh finally i would like to say that we are running a little bit out of time so for those of you who need to uh leave now uh please don't worry the webinar web will be recorded and the recording will be sent to your emails and for those of you who's able to stay as we go through the amazing questions you have raised please um do so uh, James, I am aware that you need to leave in one minute, so I can see that you have answered the questions already. And there is one more question. Um, do you still have this one minute uh, by any chance that I can raise to you? It was asked to me privately. It was not in a chat, so maybe you still have the second to answer it before you jump out. I'll try if you let me know what it is. Yeah. I'll be very fast. Sure. So um, the question is, most protected area professionals are employed by governmental agencies. What measures are there, in your opinion, to help them communicate with journalists in a way that protects them in cases where there are no, where they're not supposed to share about a political topic? Well, I mean, um, confidential government sources are often a, a source for journalists. So we are very used to working 
with anonymous sources and a good journalist will take great care to keep that that source uh confidential anonymous so um i mean uh you know do find ways you know if you can find ways to meet up with journalists in your region uh local media outlets they um i think you you can tell them you want to just speak on background and tell them that you want to stay anonymous that you have to stay anonymous to maintain your job a good journalist should respect that and not reveal his or her sources so um you know this happens all the time you know, and all kinds of issues. So you would not be alone. It is a matter, of course, trust. You need to trust the journalist and the journalist needs to trust that you're telling the truth, even if it's on background. So building that trust between journalists and government sources can be tricky, but people, it happens all over the world all the time. So I hope that can happen here too. Amazing. Thank you so much, James, for joining us today. Thank you. And this question. We will now jump to the other questions. Uh, there is one question from Nikola Kiselonov uh, asked to Simona Bohlova. Uh, Nikola, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like me to read it out for you? Okay, I can see that Nicola is no longer here, unfortunately. So um, I would just ask the question, um, Simona, how uh, can we, um, how can we apply the projects? Um, okay, this is actually a very complicated question in the way it's formulated, but I suppose the idea is that um, there is a cooperation between North Macedonia and Albania and since they are not EU countries, they are wondering how can they apply for the EU funding? That's the question. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, um, actually, uh, both Northern Macedonia and Albania are part of indirect programs uh, with the IPA countries, but it's always, always within, uh, so there is a program uh, um, Italy, Albania, uh, Montenegro, for example, where Albania can participate, well, Albanian beneficiaries can, can ask and cooperate with, uh, in this trilateral co kind of cooperation. And for Northern Macedonia, there is a program, Greece, Northern Macedonia. So uh, from this perspective, they can cooperate with their neighbors, uh, the, the EU countries. They can as well uh, cooperate in the course of the uh, transnational cooperation program, uh, Adriatic and Union uh, transnational cooperation program. Um, and there is also uh, there is also an EU funding which is supporting what we what we call so um, IPA IPA programs, meaning cooperation between the uh, the enlargement countries themselves. Uh, this is this is managed by our colleagues in the uh, directorate on uh, about on a neighborhood and enlargement, and uh, there is also a funding which is uh, which is dedicated to to such cross border cooperation. But there, this is managed by by our colleagues in the in the delegations in these countries. I hope that covers. Amazing, thank you so much, Simona, Nicola. I see that. You Yes, okay, he um, listened to the question, amazing. Uh, Martin, there is also a question to you. Um, I'm also seeing that there is another note from Leo Raring who said that um, it's amazing to have experts between the transboundary borders that speak uh, the same language or that speak various languages as it really helps in the cooperation practices itself. And the question I received is, how do you measure the long-term success of transboundary cooperation and uh, what are the key indicators that you currently focus on when working with Bavarian National Park? Um, yes, good question. Thank you, Leo. Um, um, I think um, it is a crucial to have some tool to measure the success for a long-term perspective. But it's not easy. And this is why we also invented uh, this social economical survey, uh, which gives us a robust methodological background to um, 
to um, to do a research on the attitude of the visitors, but it's not only the attitude of the visitors, but it's the attitude of the locals as well. So I think it's a good, it's important to have a good methodology uh, for a long term perspective to see the results. And if we um, if we want to see the results, not only as a, as a figures on on uh, on the screens or, uh, or 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 as a data, um, I think the only results we want to achieve is the support of the local uh, stakeholders, um, and uh, this is a long term run, and um, and the only way how we uh, uh, get that is in my opinion uh, a good communication with them and and a direct uh, involvement of the local stakeholders into the practical not only decisions but in a practical measures and um so in my opinion it is it is um it is important to to work with them directly in the long term way and the results are then uh, seen um, uh, on the data, but they are also seen within the public if we discuss some important issues uh, or some some critical issues, some such as, for example, the wolves uh, came back and and I was when they came back and we we get the first problems with uh, with the damages on the sheep. I was really su uh, surprised that there were some. Uh, farmers who told us that it is unnatural that they they are taking something from the nature and they have to give the nature something bad and I was really not prepared for this kind of reaction and in my opinion it was the result of also previous measures because before the wolves came we already had here the lynxes and of course we were working on it this is just an example uh, of the reaction or of the support we get. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Martin, for answering the question so thoroughly. Um, I'm not sure what I, why I have received so many questions privately. I suppose the audience didn't want to raise um, the questions themselves. But Anna, I also have a question for you. And it goes on to the um, challenges, common challenges and solutions. Um, the audience member is asking if you have had, if you can mention any cross-border exam cross border project examples with partners from outside the EU. Um, and what do you think were the common challenges and solutions with respect to such a case? Uh, well, uh, when it comes to the, the protection of the, the nature, but also in general, uh, I mentioned that emergency uh, situations are the, the most regulated one. For example, between the, the, the Serbia and Bosnia, which are IPA border, there is the bilateral agreement that uh, regulates the actions, the network or all of these stations that shoot the rockets to the clouds to not to have the hail. So this is also uh, related to, to the nature, but mostly it's addressing the, the people and the goods. So this is one of, of the examples, but there is also the, the many other examples in, in, in the area. So related to the, the, the protection of the, the environment in general. So it, it would take a lot of time actually to answer, but this is what first crossed my mind. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Anna. As I'm going through all the comments now, um, I'm afraid that we won't be able to raise any more questions because I can't hold everybody past this time uh, so much. Um, however, I will have the questions available and I will ask our members to provide the answers further on by email if that's possible and if the presenters um, agree to this so that we can further share it on the website also for the larger audience. And finally, I'm also going through this amazing comments that we have received. Um, everybody is very pleased with the topics we have discussed and um, people think that we have mentioned really unique cases of cooperation and unique insights that, um, that were not clear to audience before and that um, they're sure they can be using now. So 
I think this is a very good uh, finalization of this uh, amazing transboundary cooperation webinar. Thank you once again, our distinguished speakers, Anna Nikolov, Simona Pahlava, Martin Stari, and James Fan. It was a pleasure to cooperate with you, and we really hope to cooperate with you further on. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to visit the links that we will share with you after the webinar in your emails and um, stay in touch with uh, the webinars that your park produces. Thank you so much for your time today and we hope to uh, hear on your cooperation experiences further on. So let's keep in touch.